There was a king who dwelled in Eldraine with a queen by his side and four children. Those who lived within the kingdom were content, knowing they would remain in good hands for generations to come. But the king and queen were dead now, slain defending their family and castle. All of their virtue and all of their defenses meant nothing to the Phyrexian invasion. Those who thought to live long lives in peace now lie in mass graves below the heaths and meadows. Hey everyone, and welcome back to the Ether Hub. I'm Cybin, bringing you more Magic the Gathering lore. Today is the start of a new tale, a new chapter in the story of Magic the Gathering. The dust has settled on the Phyrexians' war against flesh, and the multiverse has healed through the Great Pruning. What we venture into now is a landscape mired by changes, changes that will now be explored in the wilds of Eldraine. All the consequences from Magic's latest story arc comes into plain view, as we embark on this, the Omen Path arc, and that all starts with today's story, introducing Wilds of Eldraine Chapter 1, Pure of Heart, written by K. Arsenault Rivera. Remember, you can check out the complete Wilds of Eldraine playlist by clicking on the link provided and in the video's description. If you're enjoying the content here on the Ether Hub, please consider supporting our efforts by leaving this video a like, sharing it with friends, dropping a super thanks, and becoming a subscriber. And now let's get back to the lore. Eldraine and the white-aligned realm of Ardenvale needed a new king, and Will Kenrith took the title. The knights who fought in the invasion now called Will the Boy King, and his twin sister Rowan couldn't blame them. The twins had come to see one of those knights, who had a scarred face and dented armor telling of her valor. She held a hammer the size of the Boy King himself in one hand. The other arm had been lost in battle against the Phyrexians, replaced now with enchanted wood, a gift from the Fae. For the past six months, this knight had been demanding tribute from nearby villages in exchange for driving off raiders, but the raiders in question always seemed to be wearing her colors. Will addresses this warrior, Sir Imodane, who sits on her makeshift throne, said to be made from the bodies of dissembled Phyrexians. She insists Will calls her Queen Imodane, while Will dons the mask of diplomacy, agreeing to talk as equals. Queen Imodane laughs, echoed by her raiders, and refuses to take Will, this boy king, seriously. She sees the young royal as pathetic. No one saw him on the battlefield when the Phyrexians came. Rowan, Will's sister, her anger boiling, knowing that they were fighting their own battles inside the castle, but Will remains calm and smiles. He challenges Queen Imodane to a duel. If Will won, then Queen Imodane would quit raiding and bend the knee, becoming a vassal and champion to the crown. Yet, if Imodane won, then Will's family and court would follow her instead, handing over the crown and the right to rule all of Eldraine to her. Rowan offers to fight for him, unsure if this duel would be evenly matched, yet Will refuses. Rowan knew their father or mother could have solved this problem, but Will? If he lost, he would lose more than just blood. She couldn't openly defy her brother and make him seem foolish. He was the new High King and needed to prove himself. They moved to a patch of packed dirt designated as a battleground, Queen Imodane's rebels sitting to watch. To Rowan, they seemed happier than the Knights of Ardenvale, whose faith and loyalty belonged to their old king, her father, and not necessarily to Will. A bugle sounded the beginning of the duel, and Rowan thought back to her childhood watching duels from her father's knee. She asked questions about everything she saw back then, determined to be a knight herself one day. Her father watched her tilt for the first time, his heart swelling with joy, but Phyrexia had taken that from her, taken her father from her. When she watches Will take his stance, her imagination projects their father's shadow over him, a barbed monstrosity over Queen Amodane. Imodane makes the first move, advancing with her giant hammer. Will blasts the ground with ice, and the momentum causes her to fall face first. Whatever hope they had for an honorable duel was gone. Even her rebels couldn't help but laugh. Flame bursts from Imodane's hammer, melting the ice on the field. She swings it overhead, and Will throws himself to the side like a complete and utter novice. Rowan's throat grows tight. Imodane can raise her hammer faster than Will can get up. All the anger Rowan felt while watching her father die, and all the sorrow she felt afterward, coursed through her. To name what then leaves her fingertips a bolt of lightning would be like calling a cauldron a thimble. Dark clouds recede to let the lightning through, the crack bringing everyone to their knees. 
When the dust settles, Rowan realizes what she's done. She cut a massive rift into the side of the nearest peak. Generations from now will call it Stormcutter Mountain. Rowan stares from her hand to the massive rift in disbelief. Her brother and even Queen Amodane gaped their mouths in terror. Rowan doesn't know what to say, so she stands tall and unsheaths her sword. Queen Imodane drops her hammer, turns tail, and runs into the woods. Will asks her what she's done, and Rowan only answers that he should have let her fight. He wasn't trained for this. Imodane may have fled, but her warriors now drew their swords, all looking to earn a name for themselves. There was once a noble knight who served at Castle Embereth, who drank deep and boasted loud. But now Imodane was all that remains. She runs through the thick brambles and fallen boughs until her feet land on cold stone. Wherever she is, the woods are gone. She had wandered into a glittering throne room. She hears strange music, smells wine and fruit. All around her, walls become windows, and windows become doors to who knows where. If she tries, she can see through the misty structures, but she doesn't want to try. Imodang can guess where she's landed and falls to her knees, begging forgiveness for trespassing. Two golden eyes glow from the shadows, brushing off the apology, revealing what exactly she had summoned. The Fey Lord lets out a cruel laugh, cups Imodang's chin, and asks if she is pure of heart. There's a remote village on the edge of the realm, populated by more sheep than people, called Orenshire. Kellen slinks through the door of his family's Orenshire home as his mother looks up from her spinning. She rushes over to him, inspecting the scratches on his cheek and blood on his arms. In the folds of his hood, she finds an iron nail and asks questions, the kind of questions children wish their mothers wouldn't ask. Kellen doesn't want to talk about it, so his mother calls for his stepfather to get water from the well. She leads him to a chair at the table where it's easier to fuss over him. Kellen was wiry and small for 16, all the more reason for the other boys to target him. As his mother wiped the dried blood from his face, he remembered their taunts, calling him Half-Blood, saying he never belonged there. They were afraid of him. They blamed him for the slumber. Kellen's mother plucked more nails and splinters of hue from his hair and clothes as his stepfather Ronald came through the door sloshing water. The boys had asked if his real father was one of the Fey Folk, some of the more mystical and enchanted peoples of Eldraine. To many, they were considered monsters. There was silence between them, then Ronald was the first to break it, reassuring Kellen that what matters is who he is and not where he comes from. Kellen was almost too frightened to ask, but he had to be brave. All the heroes in his stories were brave. He asked if he belonged in the woods, in the lands of the Fey. But his mother replies that the woods are dangerous, and if they went there, they would face them together when he was older. She embraces him, saying that he belongs here with them, no matter what anyone else says. As much as Kellen loves his family, when he looks to the woods, all he feels is longing. Will and Rowan's home, Castle Ardenvale, lies in charred ruins. Will takes up residence in the neighboring Blue Align Castle, Vantress. Will sits in the war room, buried beneath a mound of paperwork, alliances, tax arrangements, oaths of fealty, and blistering condemnations. It was clear to Rowan how all of this had worn on her brother, seeing the bags under his eyes and stubbly chin. She announces that she's leaving, and Will advises her not to think with her sword arm, nagging her more than their father ever did. Rowan had a speech planned, but now she found the words had changed. She thought leaving was the best thing she could do for the realm right now, before word spread about what happened at the cliffs. Will's cold words cut her off, reading a letter aloud that said, The Marquise of Roxburgh would not bend the knee to a man who lets his sister inflict such harm on others. He met Rowan's eyes, telling her there are more letters of the same. They could have avoided this, if only she had trusted him. Pain pricked her temple, a headache she'd been dealing with lately warned her patience. She told her brother he would be dead if she didn't interfere. Her brother wasn't the true king. He hadn't gone on the high quest. The high quest was given by the questing beast to candidates who hoped to be worthy to lead the realms. Their father had completed it, but after his death, Will simply took the crown when Ardenvale needed a king. He didn't always want his sister to save him. He had a plan to unite Eldraine, but blasting a hole in a mountain was no one's idea of unity. Will argued that what she'd done wasn't what their parents would have wanted. Rowan's anger burst. Their parents wouldn't have ignored a curse that spread through the kingdom. Maybe this wicked slumber was unity, but all those inflicted would need more than a handshake and a cup of ale to wake up. 
Their parents had earned their titles, and Will called himself High King because he thought it suited him no matter how much Rowan told him otherwise. Rowan knows she's gone too far, but she's fine with it, as long as they found a way to solve the problem. The wicked slumber had stopped the Phyrexians in their tracks, but now it spread to the citizens of Eldraine. They fell asleep and nothing could ever wake them, neither true love's kiss or a bucket of ice water. Castle Vantress's finest minds had not figured out how to wake the dreamers, but they didn't have access to the multiverse. The twins do. For all of their differences, they share one thing between them, their spark. Will argued that he had to stay on Eldraine as High King. His difference of opinion kept Rowan from planeswalking away. Rowan strains against her brother's power, trying to override his control over their spark. She closes her eyes and once more sees the long halls of Castle Ardenvale, her father fighting a Phyrexian behemoth, her stepmother Lyndon, and their siblings running away. She heard Lyndon's voice telling her to keep them safe and live well. Rowan knows how the story ends and doesn't want to see it. Rowan's chest feels tight. Whenever she closes her eyes, she sees their father dead on the end of a Phyrexian blade. She couldn't clear her mind enough to planeswalk. Their spark didn't seem to respond. In fact, she couldn't feel it at all. Her brother could stay if he wanted to, but she was going one way or another. Every new moon, Kellen would walk with his mother to an old willow tree at the edge of the woods. They'd sit against its trunk and his mother would tell him stories. Lately, instead of new heroes every time, she told him of two in particular. A woman who fled her training as a hedge witch, and the young man she saved from a troll. Through the wilds they journeyed together, facing all manner of beast and mage. Kellen has a feeling he knows who they are, but he enjoys getting to know them all the same. This night, he's running to the top of the hill, the family's sheepdog on his heels. The dog's name is Hex, and he barks, drool hanging from his jowls, as he bounds through the grass. At last, they reach the tree, both panting, and look over the village. Kellen searches for his mother, who promised to meet him there, but he can't see her. What he does see is an archway of translucent stone that he had never seen there before. His mother had prepared him for this. It was an invitation to speak with one of the high fairies. Kellen finally sees his mother running up the hill, apparently unaware of the archway. He could wait for her, ignore the archway, and let it fade away. But the voices of his tormentors rang in his ears, telling him again he doesn't belong here. Could it be Kellen's real father had finally taken notice of him? A hero never hesitates. He passes through the archway, leaving Hex behind to bark up a storm. A gust of wind shoves him through and dumps him on a cool, mossy floor. The grass is all silver. The twisting trees bear jeweled fruit. In the distance, there are giant, thatch-roofed houses, while he's surrounded by tiny castles populated by miniature knights. Kellen sees a staircase, on top of which is a throne, with a figure sitting upon it. True beauty is enough to strike the viewer senseless. Same was for Kellen, for the figure sitting on the throne was as beautiful as the stars themselves. He can't comprehend what he's seen as the figure flashes a wicked smile. The figure asks Kellen, the brave hero, if he is pure of heart. The stories said it was best to avoid looking at the Fae directly, so he stares at the ground and replies that he would like to be. The figure asked if Kellen was truly his father's son, seeing his wounds and knowing Kellen had not fought back. Kellen's heart skips a beat, and he asks the figure if he knew his real father, taking a step to get a better look. Roses lash his feet in place so he can't get any closer. The figure warns him his blood gives him some protection here, but if he takes a step forward, he would be forsaking his realm for this one. This was the Fairy Lord, Kellen realized, and tried to kneel the way knights do. The Fae Lord introduces themselves as Lord Talion, and informs him that their kind surrenders nothing. If Kellen would do them a service, Lord Talion would give him answers about his father. His mother had told him that the Fae do not lie. Talion hums a lovely song, snaps their fingers, and two more Fae appear, each bearing a bowl of fruit. Kellen was hungry, but his mother taught him well. The Fae do nothing for free. He refuses both bowls, and Talion waves them away with a smirk. The Fae Lord told him that witches three have this land with slumber plagued. Agatha the Hungry, in search of heroes to throw in her great cauldron. Cruel Hilda, who has taken Winter's crown. Wherever there are lovers and lords, you shall find the enchanting Irit. Whoever is brave enough to defeat them shall break the wicked slumber and earn a boon from Talion's treasury. 
Talion was in need of a real hero, and the bravest thing Kellen had ever done was walk through that archway. He had never fought a battle or completed a quest, but how could he say no? Maybe his father was a strapping fairy knight, or perhaps a cunning mage. Whoever he was, he was someone Talion respected, and that had to mean something. Kellen's mother glimpsed this land of silver grass once and decided to leave it, but Kellen wants to know more. He could fail, but if he succeeds, he would finally know the truth. Cullen agreed to Talion's quest. And there you guys go, our first chapter in Wilds of Eldraine as we experience Heroes of the Plain Forever Changed and new heroes just now starting their very first adventure. I'm excited to see where they take this new protagonist, Kellen. As I thought from my previous video, he's a little young and a tad naive, but I think that gives this character a lot of room to grow in the story. So there's a lot to look forward to there. But what I'm really excited to see is this growing dynamic between Will and Rowan Kenrith. We know that peace won't always be the only path these two take, and how that will come about has me really pumped for this story. Besides what I'm looking forward to in Wilds of Eldraine, it was great for the story to explore the immediate aftermath of the Phyrexian invasion. I think this will be the theme for most of the planes we visit in the story going forward in this arc. The Phyrexian invasion was no small thing, and neither are its consequences, so it's good to not just drop that as a plot point when exploring a world affected by it. And that's exactly what we got a taste of in this story, an Eldraine devastated by an invasion no one saw coming. Anyway, that's going to do it for today's video, guys. Be sure to click that subscribe button and tick the notification bell as we continue with Wilds of Eldraine's story over the next week. That way you never miss out when a new video drops. If you enjoyed this content, be sure to support the channel by leaving a like, sharing it with friends, and dropping a super thanks. It all goes a long way in helping this channel grow. As always, thank you all so much for watching, and until next time, guys, see ya!